Welcome all to the Dyson School of Design Engineering. My name is Rafael Calvo. I'm a professor and director for research at the school. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now, normally we will be welcoming, welcoming you into our design engineering building in South Kensington in London where we will be able to offer you nibbles and drinks and the opportunity to network and socialize with our students and staff and industry partners. But of course, this is not possible. Uh, so before I introduce our team speaker, I would like to give you a quick sense of who we are. Uh, we are the youngest school at Imperial College and have been operating since 2014. So there are 10 engineering schools in, in Imperial College. We have a four-year degree, the Master's in Design Engineering, and we have two double master's programs, Innovation Design Engineering, that has been running now for 40 years, it's our 40th anniversary, and the Global Innovation Design. Both are uh, jointly run with the Royal College of Arts, just around the road. Uh, as well as the uh, two master's programs, and we have, um, sorry, one of the two master's programs is the uh, global innovation design program where students spend time in different partner universities in Japan, in China, and in the US. Our students learn and apply uh, project skills from design, from engineering, for product innovation, with the aim of making sustainable and positive change. Our research work is purpose-driven and it's geared towards innovating solutions in specific areas. In our school, we currently have four of these areas, future mobility, health and aging, sustainable growth, and AI and data. And today's speaker will be perfectly linked to two of these, uh, the health and aging and the AI and data. She feels falls exactly in, in that space, in at that intersection. So I, I met Moon Moon um, several years ago uh, due to our shared interest on applying computational techniques to support people going through difficult times. She was one of the participants of a workshop I organized in 2016. And since then, I have been following her outstanding work. Moon Moon uh, is an associate professor of interactive computing at Georgia Tech. She's best known for laying the, fund laying the foundations of a line of research that develops computational techniques to responsibly and ethically employ social media in understanding and improving our mental health. She combines social computing, machine learning, and natural language processing with insights and theories that come from social, behavioral, and clinical sciences. Uh, she was recently recognized with the 2021 ACM Rising Star Award um, in 2019, she had the Complex Systems Society Junior Science Award, and she has received 13 Best Paper and Honorable Mentions from the ACM and the AAAI, and received extensive coverage in New York Times, in the NPR, and the BBC. In 2020, she served as the General Chair of the 14th AAAI International Conference in Web and Social Media. Uh, that is the leading conference on interdisciplinary studies of social media. Earlier, she was a faculty associate at the Bergman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard and a postdoc at Microsoft Research. And she obtained her PhD in computer science from Arizona State University. Welcome, Moon Moon. Thank you very much, Rafa. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you. And um, as the title shows up, uh, in my talk today, we will be reviewing some of the work that we have been doing at the intersection of social media and mental health over the past few years. Um, you know, in that field, what we have seen to have worked well so far or been successful, what we are still missing. And then I'll be discussing a couple of case studies that would use synergistic and critically leaning um, approaches, specifically collaborative action research approach, approaches that would allow us to you know, reflect and think about you know, how do we go about filling some of the existing gaps. And then I'm gonna conclude with some directions for what I envision as sort of the future challenges 
that uh, challenges that need to be resolved in future work. Um, and uh, that will be critical to see some of the potential of these data sources like social media um, uh, to support digital mental health efforts in the real world. Uh, so before I get started, I would uh, I have a content war warning. I would note that uh, there are some descriptions of serious mental illnesses, uh, suicide, and self harm in this presentation. So you know it goes without saying that we are living in this uh, you know hyper digital age today, right? Uh, uh, we are using these platforms. Uh, millions of people are using platforms such as social media, search engines, and so on. Um, and uh, we have seen uh, a rise of research that is appropriating the data that is left behind by people on these platforms to um, helping us understand a number of different things about uh, people, our behaviors, social phenomena, and so on. So there has been emergence of a field called the computational social science. And you know these digital data sources are providing us new ways to think about measuring social interactions, our moods and emotions, our political ideologies, you know, our collective action, and most relevantly to this um, talk today, our health and well-being. So um, let me take the opportunity now to share with you some of the highlights um, of the work that my collaborators, students, and myself have conducted over the years. And hopefully that will give you a little bit of a sense of the computation of the possible computational use of social media data for mental health. Um, so how to structure this conversation? I gave it a little bit of thought. And I thought that you know in the past year, we have all been experiencing a number of different crises in our lives, and the most notable of that is the still ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. So the examples I'm drawing from um, are going to highlight some of the work we have been doing around different crisis events, including COVID-19, and the role that social media has been playing here in order to help us understand mental health in these you know, difficult trying times. Um, and I'm going to use um, the established social ecological model as a conceptual framework um, to structure uh, this initial part of our conversation. So first off, uh, focusing on the individual, uh, one thing that we, we would note if we reflect back is that crisis in today's digital age, they're frequently accompanied by a variety of information that are circulated on the web and social media. A lot of it is valuable information, but also um, there is a lot of misleading information that circulates on these platforms. So while these crisis events, they obviously are having a lot of direct impact on some people, but also a considerable number of us, we are getting impacted indirectly in some ways because of our exposure to misinformation. And you know what can be a better example of that than the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, so in this uh, new study, we have been um, trying to understand how exposure to misinformation as can be indicated by people's sharing behaviors on social media um, that affects people's psychological well-being um, so what we did here was to conduct a large-scale observational study um, using a prop propensity score matching based causal framework um, that uh, included over 80 million Twitter posts that were made by over 76 million Twitter users. Um, and this analysis spanned an year and a half long period in the early part of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what did we find? We found that you know people who shared COVID-19 misinformation on social media, they experienced actually approximately two times additional increase in their anxiety levels when compared to other people who did not share misinformation. Um, but moving further, what was more striking to us is that if is sociodemographic attributes had a strong connection with these patterns. So we found that female in, uh, users on, of, of Twitter are Asian minorities and people with lower levels of education, they experienced a disproportionately higher increase in anxiety when compared with other users who shared misinformation. So this uh, study allowed us to gather new kinds of evidence. Um, there is a lot of efforts by social media platforms towards moderating misinformation and its adverse effects. And um, here we shed new light on the impacts that misinformation around crisis events can be having on people's mental well-being. And how do we think about uh, allocating resources as a part of our crisis response that can um, help us bring help to um, particularly vulnerable individuals? 
So now let us talk about uh, communities uh, using the social ecological model. And here we focused on um, a particular type of situated community, college campuses, and we focused on a different type of crisis, which is gun violence incidents. Um, uh, so, you know, what we did in this study is that we wanted to see how social media postings um, that are shared as, as by individuals in situated communities, how that can allow us to quantify um, and examine stress responses after um, a variety of different college campuses in the United States experienced a gun violence incident. So we focused on 12 such incidents of mass shooting in um, a five-year period, um, and we gathered postings from college subreddits. So these are essentially dedicated communities on Reddit um, where students and other members of uh, college campuses come and discuss um, aspects of their lives, their academic challenges, uh, and so on. So we developed an interrupted time series framework here, um, and we found that using this approach, we could see amplified levels of stress that followed violent incidents, um, such as these gun violence incidents. And these deviated from sort of the usual stress patterns that we observed on campuses. So a lot of college students already have chronic levels of stress for academic reasons. But what we found is that there are distinctive temporal and linguistic changes that characterize these campus communities, um, such as you know, reduced cognition, higher self-preoccupation, death-related conversations um, uh, in the aftermath of these gun violence incidents. Um, so, so basically, you know, what this study told us is that these kinds of violent crisis events on campuses, they may aggravate student stress. That is not a surprise. But what it tells us is that how do those stress responses change and the resultant um, introduction of fear, trauma, and even emergence of solidarity that we can glean by looking at social media postings of these situated communities. Um, and then, um, you know, it tells us that these crisis events can have a variety of different impacts on the members of these um, situated communities and how can administrators and managers of these communities think about bringing help to particularly vulnerable um, groups of people um, and then uh, better respond to these crises that adversely impact um, uh, the situated experience in these communities. All right. So now moving on to uh, the population level, um, again, we return to the topic of COVID-19, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, we know that it has been causing a lot of dis disruptions in our personal and collective lives worldwide from the very beginning. Um, but what is sort of less understood is the impact that the pandemic is having on the mental health, cons uh, mental health states of individuals. So we had this uh, goal in the study. We wanted to gather population level insights regarding people's psychosocial concerns in the early part of the pandemic, and we used social media data for that purpose. So we had about 60 million Twitter postings that we um, gathered um, within the United States, um, spanning a two-month period from the middle of March, which is when a lot of the, the lockdown started around the pandemic, and then compared it, um, and then went uh, two months ahead into end of May, and then we compared uh, postings that were shared on Twitter for the same time period in the year before, that was 2019. Um, so what did we find? So we found that you know the psychosocial expressions in 2020 were significantly different um, compared to the year before. Um, so for instance, a lot of the mental health indicators, whether it's depression, anxiety, uh, suicidal ideation, these showed increased levels in 2020. But what was interesting is that you would notice that in these charts is also that there was a plateauing effect that we observed in the later part of the time period of our analysis, which maybe tells us that people got habituated or people settled into a new normal. So why was that happening? To understand that, we looked at the language um, that people were using in their postings on Twitter uh, during this time. And we found that people expressed a variety of you know, concerns regarding um, their uh, personal and professional lives, you know, access to health care, various kinds of precautionary measures like social distancing, um, other kinds of pandemic-related awareness topics, and so on. And at the same time, they also appropriated social media to seek support and engage in candid 
conversations on mental health, um, giving us the hope that maybe um, the pandemic ha has been providing us a mechanism to think about what could be possible ways of um, destigmatizing the topic uh, of mental health and supporting individuals who might be struggling um, with these challenges. So but broadly speaking, this study provides us uh, insights um, how mental health stakeholders and policymakers can be thinking about planning and implementing measures that can, you know, um, think about curbing this dual epidemic um, alongside an ongoing pandemic, um, and that is mental health, and what could be ways for us to tackle that um, in parallel. All right, so you know these potentials that we just reviewed in these three studies, um, uh, we work on them, but obviously we are not the only ones working in this space. Uh, these kinds of potentials have now been showcased to be valid and, and validated across a number of different contexts, different platforms, different mental health domains, populations, as you can see from the research of these illustrious authors in, in this field. So now you might be wondering, you know, what is the next step in this line of work? Um, for instance, are we ready for real world deployment or use of these models? And clearly that has not quite happened so far. And the question comes, what is preventing us from pursuing these directions? So I would note three issues that we need to pay attention to and address before you know we can realize the potential of social media data and related data and these algorithmic insights. Um, so these are um, agency and power, um, unintended negative consequences, and ethics. These issues are so important because they raise a number of questions for us as, as researchers. So for instance, the first and foremost, how do we consent people, right? I mean, eventually when we deploy these algorithms, we want to have the support of the very people um, whose data is being analyzed. Um, what kind of provisions should we have to prevent adverse outcomes? Again, we are dealing with a population that is already vulnerable and algorithmic insights um, can uh, potentially exacerbate instead of helping people and how do we prevent those kinds of adverse outcomes. There are questions of how we go about protecting um, a vulnerable population um, who is subject to this research. So for, you know, questions of, uh, you know, new ways of discrimination, uh, questions of, um, you know, um, a power balance between different stakeholders of mental health, these are important questions for us to consider. And then, you know, the important one that, you know, keeps me up um, at night oftentimes is that what is sort of the social and ethical responsibility, moral responsibility of researchers like ourselves, you know, in minimizing potential harms and risks to individuals. And, you know, we can keep on adding a number of questions that fall along these three uh, topics. But ultimately, what these questions point to is that we need um, to consider, um, you know, these issues as a part of the research process itself, instead of as an afterthought. So in the remainder of the talk, what I'll be doing is I'll be presenting a theoretical lens that can um, that we can adopt um, as um, researchers in this field to make our research not just rigorous and ethical and, and thorough, but also think about how to make them practical and actionable in the real world. So this particular research lens that I'm going to be using is called the action research uh, framework. So action research is actually a philosophy as much as it is a methodology of research, and it's applied uh, extensively in the qualitative social sciences field. It goes back quite a bit. It was coined by Kurt Lewine in 1944. And what it does, the beauty of this framework is that it seeks transformative change as a part of the research itself um, through sort of the simultaneous process of taking action and doing research. Um, and essentially those two pieces are linked together by critical reflection. So, you know, you can think of this framework as a spiral of steps, each of which, you know, is, is uh, composed of a circle of planning, taking action, fact finding about the result of the action and so on. But the tricky part is that um, we are talking about digital mental health and we are talking about computational uh, work and machine learning. And there is actually no formal guidance on how do we go about adopting the action research framework, a paradigm in this kind of work. So what I'm gonna be doing is through the two case studies that I'll be highlighting, um, I would showcase one possible way that we can adopt a collaborative um, approach uh, that borrows from this framework um, and how can we work on a shared goal and mission between our team and the organization 
we partnered with. So again, uh, the two case studies, one is going to be focused um, um, and centered around the individual level and how we can do that partnership to um, benefit the individual. And the other will be at the population level, thinking about population level benefits and balancing that with risks and harms. So speaking of uh, the first uh, case study, it is an ongoing um, uh, partnership that um, my group has been having uh, with Northwell Health over uh, the last um, four to five years. Um, Northwell um, is uh, both a health system and also a research institution doing cutting edge research in um, kind of bringing um, new techniques to bear on mental health treatment. So the project uh, that we are working on is called the Thrive. And our broader goal here has been to think about how to take uh, some of the insights that we can get uh, from patient social media data um, and using them in, um, uh, in ways that can support clinical tools, support the design of clinical tools, and eventually uh, influence clinical decision making, tailoring treatment, um, supporting collaboration between patients and clinicians and mental health care, and, and so on. The specific question and the study I'm going to be highlighting is around relapse. And relapse is a really key question when we talk about clinical decision making in, in mental health care. Um, talking about a specific, um, particularly debilitating mental illness, schizophrenia, it affects about 1% of the population. But you know what is harder is that even for people who are under treatment, about 80% of the patients, they relapse in about five years of time. So clinicians are often challenged with this question of relapse because they get to know that a relapse has happened after the relapse has actually happened, which is when the patient shows up to the doctor um, with exacerbated symptoms and the doctor now has to hospitalize the patient to get those symptoms under control. So it's a retrospective knowledge that the um, clinicians are working with at the moment. For years, clinicians have been looking for ways how to change that status quo. And changing the status quo here will be the idea that the clinicians can now um, find ways to look at early markers, early symptoms that can uh, you know, indicate that a person is vulnerable to relapse in the future. So essentially, this kind of a proactive approach to identifying the indicators of relapse can have a lot of impact on treatment. Uh, it can lead to, let's say, adjustments in medication. It can lead to changes in therapy. And hopefully, it can prevent a relapse hospitalization from happening altogether. So that was what motivated this problem. And we wanted to see is, but is whether by looking at patient social media data, if we can find uh, predictors of relapse, and how well can we predict this these events uh, at all. So patients are an important stakeholder here, and we are working with actual mental health patient data. Um, so here we are reporting on an analysis that spanned, uh, spanned a little over 100 patients um, uh, in the first two years of the study. Um, and these patients were evaluated by clinicians to have a, to be suffering from a psychotic disorder, um, um, such as schizophrenia spectrum disorders. And about half of these individuals had at least one relapse um, at that point in time when this data was collected. And here relapses are defined as hospitalizations. Um, all of these individuals agreed to share their Facebook feeds, Facebook data archives with us, uh, giving us tremendous opportunities to pursue this um, sort of longitudinal question of looking at, at past data and seeing whether they contain any markers of relapse uh, going forward. So now let me tell you a little bit about our uh, considerations and our modeling approach, which were guided through our discussions with these clinical partners as a part of this action research framework. So the thing that was central in our considerations was that, um, you know, um, relapse events are multifactorial. And what that means is that they manifest in many different ways for many different reasons and different people. So essentially, these are heavily, these events are heavily associated with clinical heterogeneity. Um, so standardized population level classification approaches, for instance, a regression approaches based on supervised learning are not really suitable um, here because we are talking about very unique patterns of behaviors that are likely to trigger a uh, relapse in a certain individual that may or may not be applicable in another person. 
The second challenge and consideration in our modeling approach was that there are actually no true positive or negative examples in the setup. Um, and that's because any individual at any point in time actually has a non-zero likelihood of relapse going forward. And the question is not about whether somebody would relapse or not. The question more about is what is the chance that this particular person could have a relapse and when could that happen? That when question is really important. So essentially what this meant is that it um, ruled out supervised learning approaches for us because for these clinicians, our action, action research uh, framework said that they're not as much interested in the predictive ability of social media um, for relapse, but rather given a certain patient who a clinician might be seeing, might be in front of them at a point in time uh, during an appointment, they want to answer the question, what is the likelihood that this person could have a relapse and when could that happen? All right, so, so to counteract the reality of this data and to also enhance potential usage, these discussions as a part of the action research framework with the clinicians, they were super uh, insightful to us. So we settled on modeling the relapse prediction problem as an anomaly detection problem, where the idea is that, you know, in, in some ways the relapse is an aberration in behaviors um, and uh, it deviates from the baseline behavior of that same person. So for every person, we identified periods of health, which were essentially baseline data for us. It spanned one to three months um, when there was no relapse hospitalization. And then we had periods of relapse, again, for each individual. These were a month of data um, that preceded uh, hospitalization. And these were the anomalies in, in our framework. So what did we find? So a one-class SVM framework, which is a commonly used um, um, anomaly detection framework, allowed us to get some insights into the ability to pre predict relapses. I want you to look at two measures here, which is specificity and sensitivity. Here, specificity means relapses that were predicted to be relapses correctly. And we see that that number does pretty well. We, uh, we can do that for about 79% of the cases. But where we don't do so well on is um, sensitivity, where our model thinks that a specific time period is a period of relapse. Although in our gold standard data, we see that it is a healthy period. So the action research framework, because of its iterative nature, allows us to go back to the data, go back to these conversations with these clinicians to identify why this might be happening and that understanding is super important if you want to be able to use these algorithms in some ways in practical settings. So we conducted an error analysis in response to unpack what might be leading to some of these differences in performance. Um, and this evaluation relied on what is known as clinical chart data, which are a part of the medical records of all patients at this um, health system. Um, so uh, we were interested in analyzing the false negatives here, which are essentially periods of relative health, which were wrongly predicted as uh, a relapse by our anomaly detection model. What we found is that for about half of these false negative time periods, we had some data in the patient's electronic medical record. So that was great. But what was even better is that for about 90% of those cases with some data, we did notice that the clinician had noted the presence of some kind of psychotic symptoms at that point in time when they saw the patient. Um, but Again, the subjectivity of mental health evaluation. At that point in time, these clinicians did not judge the condition or the symptoms to be severe enough that would warrant a hospitalization. But because this context was missing from the way we constructed the gold standard labels or ground truth data for models, our models just assume that the ground truth says the person was healthy at this point in time. So basically, you know, this work, it allows us, uh, broadly speaking, to go beyond kind of thinking about social media to do classifications of who might be at, um, you know, diagnosed with a certain uh, mental health condition or not, but rather it allows us to think about a personalized approach. Uh, it allows us to think about given a person's, um, you know, um, uh, data or behaviors over a long period of time. Can we forecast the likelihood of imminent adverse mental health outcomes in this case, um, relapse? And what this tells us is that um, there are certain uh, uh, assessments where we can do pretty well, but also there are certain ones where 
these models are not so great. And that is complicated by the subjectivity of mental health evaluation, the differences across clinicians. So it, it inspires us to think about how can we bring the algorithm as a partner in mental health treatment where it can um, augment uh, a clinician's understanding of symptoms and the patient's condition and how can we use both the ex types of expertise as the one coming from the clinician and the algorithm in a concerted fashion to intervene and to provide these personalized mental health um, care. All right, so now let me move on to the next case study here. Um, like if you recall, I said that our second case study that uses the action research framework will be about population level um, assessments using mental health, uh, using uh, social media data. And uh, this is a collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US. Um, and we have been involved in this collaboration for the last um, uh, two years now, um, and our central goal has been to inform suicide prevention efforts that would use social media in conjunction with other types of public health data, something that CDC already uses as a part of their surveillance work. So our project, which is called Reduce, um, uh, is founded on um, a very alarming pattern in the US in the last 20 years. And, and that is the rates of suicide across different population groups. They have been monotonically increasing. So while an important question here is obviously why that is the case, an equally important question is that how can we figure out how much increases are we going to see going forward? Um, that question is important because you want to make uh, these governmental agencies like the CDC, they want to make budgetary decisions, they want to deploy interventions, adapt policies for improving timely access to care, or even think about, you know, de um, designing different kinds of programs for suicide prevention. But at the moment, they cannot do that very adequately because there is actually no real-time information on suicide fatality trends to guide these efforts. In fact, you will be even more alarmed to know that um, this is June 2021, the most recent data that um, CDC has access to to inform its suicide prevention efforts is from December 2019. So there is about one or two years of lag between when national statistics of suicide rates become available um, and when these decisions about public health interventions need to be made. So essentially, we were in search of, um, in this collaborative research, we're in search of a machine learning approach that could allow us to bring in or harness some real-time data sources such as social media, such as web searches and so on, um, that could allow us to bridge this gap, which is provide real-time signals to these stakeholders so that they can uh, be more evidence-based in uh, their public health efforts. So what we did here is we built, uh, we developed and validated a two-phase machine learning pipeline. Um, we uh, leveraged a variety of different, very disparate, but these were complementary streams of real-time um, signals related to suicide. Um, these were um, health services administrative data, such as visits to emergency uh, departments, uh, calls that were placed on uh, the US National Suicide Prevention Helpline, uh, calls made on the Poison Center um, a Helpline for overdose of substance use, uh, we also used macroeconomic data, such as unemployment data. Um, uh, uh, we used meteorological data because clearly weather has an impact. Um, and then uh, when it comes to online data, we used social media, a variety of social media platforms, search engine trends, and so on. Um, and then um, the idea was to harness the best possible signals from these um, data sources in order to come up with a composite estimate of weekly um, rates of suicide um, in uh, the, at the national level in the U.S. And our hypothesis here was that, you know, there has been a lot of work that uses a single source of data to make these estimations. But our hypothesis here was that when we actually combine information from these varied sources, it would allow us to enhance the accuracy of estimates than could be possible uh, by looking at any individual data source um, alone. All right, so this is a brief overview of our overall framework. Um, uh, you know, it was a two-phase machine learning pipeline. Um, the idea here at first was to find the best predictor of the weekly number of suicide fatalities for 
a given data source. Um, uh, we took a training validation approach there. Uh, basically, what we did is we, for a model for a given data source, it was trained based on the time series data from that same source and the weekly number of suicides over that period of time. Um, and then um, it uh, would give us an optimal estimate, optimal prediction for that data source. And then we had a second phase uh, where we used deep learning and we combined these predictions that were given um, by each of these data sources in an ensemble way. Um, and uh, that allowed us to optimally combine these estimates into a single estimate of weekly um, suicide fatalities um, that um, you know, learned from these series of weak learners and came up with a robust estimate. So the question is, how did this model perform, right? So I want here, there are a lot of numbers. I want uh, you uh, to pay attention to the very last row here. Uh, so what we found is that when we combine different data sources using a deep neural network, expectedly, um, all of the ensembles actually improved our models than when we used single data sources. But importantly, this very last row, or the all data sources row, this ensemble, uh, it outperformed predictions that were made by not just the individual models, but also the best performing baseline model. So what was the baseline model here? Our baseline model um, made estimates um, using historical uh, suicide fatality data. It was a seasonally adjusted model called Cold winters, which uh, is sort of the state of the art in prediction of um, suicide at the moment. Specifically, this ensemble model that we developed, it uh, improved not just the correlation, but it also reduced the absolute uh, margin of error of weekly suicide fatalities by approximately half. And then the error for the annual estimate uh, of suicide to less than one tenth of that baseline model. So just to give you a feel of what that looks like, the ground truth here, this is 2019 data, the ground truth here was 14.4 people um, who died by suicide um, in that year per 100,000 uh, of the US population. And our model um, gave that number to be 14.4, which has a very small error of only 0.55% um, uh, for that year. So what were some of the takeaways on this research? So like what I was saying earlier in our um, conversation is that currently actually we don't have an established way to gather real time national information on suicide trends in the US. And that is so important for timely suicide prevention efforts. So what we showed is that we can combine information from both sort of online big data real time sources and combine it with like traditional health signals such as that comes from um, emergency department visits or other ways that people access mental health care such as uh, you know the suicide prevention helplines and when we combine these we are able to achieve a fairly accurate estimation um, in a near real-time fashion that in some ways is less prone to underlying biases or idiosyncrasies or unique characteristics of any different data source um, and that is very important because you know the the people who uh, talk about suicide and social media are probably not the people who are going um, to the emergency room for their suicide needs. And the person um, who picks up the phone and dials that 800 number for um, to, do, to get help um, on a um, mental health crisis is probably never going to post about that on social media. But when we harness signals from these multiple complementary data sources, we can be more robust about, uh, against um, missing certain entire segments of the population. And it can allow us to get a more comprehensive view um, of what is going on. So at this at the moment, um, CDC is considering using some of these insights and deploying that as a part of their suicide uh, surveillance uh, efforts. Um, but also there are a lot of uh, important work to be done here, which is, uh, you know, geographical differences, sociodemographic uh, differences. But the potential that this study tells us is that these real time data sources, uh, when combined with traditional data, it can allow us um, to answer questions such as whether there will be an upturn in suicide fatalities in the near future, and if so, by how much. All right, so um, starting to wrap this up, um, what is sort of the path forward? Um, I reviewed a lot of um, research in a short amount of time, and you might be trying to figure out what is sort of 
the the vision in the year years that are um, going to be coming up in the future. So, you know, th what we discussed are, are clearly promising solutions and um, this framework of collaborative action research, it can provide us with a viable approach to help translate some of the potential of social media in real world context because they're based on these intertwined collaborations back and forth between computational researchers like ourselves and organizations who are actually uh, having the infrastructure, whether it's clinicians or public health organization to bring the help to the people who need it. Uh, but obviously I would note that these methods are far from complete. And I do recognize a lot of unanswered questions remain in the speed. The first question is around real world translation, right? And there were some interesting dichotomies we discussed in the first uh, case study where the sensitivity was much lower, um, but the specificity was higher. So this begs the question that, you know, how much algorithmic performance do we need for real world translation? When do we know that this algorithm can now be used in the real world? And when do we know that you, you have to continue to work on improving the algorithm? There is a related question there, which is how do we support graceful failures when our data and models, they do not stand up to the potential use case? Because obviously, machine learning models are never completely perfect, right? Um, the question is, how, where do we draw the line about what is acceptable? And importantly, how do we ensure that these models in some ways imbibe what clinicians imbibe in their work, which is the Hippocratic oath of doing no harm. How do we ensure that these models are built on that very principle? And then we have to recognize whenever we talk about deploying interventions is that interventions do not exist in a vacuum, right? They, are, they exist as a part of a socially situated, culturally situated, structurally influenced pathway of care, right? Um, um, for instance, some of our work has shown that people can be dissuaded from pursuing um, a certain form of mental health care, such as mental health helplines, if they have a poor experience in therapy. Um, uh, and, and there are spillover effects when people's experiences do not align with um, what they expected to see. So when we introduce new um, uh, tools, such as these algorithms in mental health care domain, how do we overcome those challenges? And how do we ensure that, that those interventions exist as a part of the pathways of care that currently exist? You know, there are obviously questions of, of the future of mental health work, because eventually we are not the ones who are interfacing with the vulnerable populations. It is the clinicians, it is the public health experts, the social workers. Um, and there are questions about what does it mean for their clinical work practices, right? Um, are we talking about a future where these individuals now have to learn about machine learning? And that's a huge burden um, on their time, on their efforts. Um, so we have to think about who could be the bridge between translating between what the algorithms can tell us and how they are actually used by these um, uh, mental health um, caregivers and clinicians and public health workers in, in the future going forward. Then there are questions of you know balancing agency and automation there as well. It is not about giving these individuals access to um, mental health um, uh, prediction algorithms, but also ensuring that these individuals feel um, that they are still part of the care team. Um, they don't feel that they are now disposable because there is now an AI that is gonna take over their jobs. So essentially we still want people to have the agency, whether it's uh, the clinicians and public health experts or it is the patients themselves. Um, we want them to have a shared understanding, a shared mental model between what the algorithm provides and what they bring to the table. And there needs to be trust between those two partners. Obviously, to ensure trust, we have to think about questions of interpretability, transparency, and so on, which are really uh, important topics that are being discussed in the AI and machine learning field um, today. Um, and then there are impacts. When we talk about the nature of mental health work, we have to talk about the impact that these algorithms could potentially have on the therapeutic alliance and boundaries between the uh, patients and the mental health caregivers. And as we think about um, you know, real world deployed uh, systems that use these algorithms and that would function over time, we therefore have to recognize you know, how do we 
how do we use these technologies to support sustained relationships? So to give you an example, oftentimes clinicians as a part of their training are told that do not add your patient on social media um, uh, to, to maintain those therapeutic boundaries. But now we are talking about a future where it, it seems like some of the insights from social media can actually be valuable to the conversations between a clinician and patient. So how do we now support that? That doesn't jeopardize the therapeutic alliance between the patient and the clinician, but actually augments it. Obviously, there are questions of social justice, a topic we have been um, thinking about a lot as a community in the last year. Um, you know, how can these uh, tools be used to support marginalized or low resource communities? Oftentimes, mental health is a challenge that disproportionately impacts and marginalizes people. Um, and as we think about these building these algorithms, whether it is to influence individual care or public health efforts, we have to think about um, people's identity um, and identity um, uh, you know, preferences. When we think about deploying these algorithms in interventions, we have to think about how people's identity influences how they interpret these systems to work and the kind of care that they want to. Because people um, uh, want care to be conscious or sensitive to their identities, whether it is based on their race, their gender identity, um, or sexual preference. And then finally, um, we have to recognize that we are not just trying to develop the most accurate algorithm here. Um, so it's not just a technical problem, although it's a really important one. But rather, we have to think about this entire invest set series of in investigations as though we are tackling a socio-technical problem. Um, and it's a socio-technical problem because of the social piece. Um, and as the quote that you would see on the slide uh, says is that, you know, many people have mistrust um, in the existing mental health system. And um, technology has the risk of exacerbating those mistrusts. Um, so the question is, how do we humanize our approaches so that that patients and individuals feel that they have an opportunity to work with other stakeholders to define what may work best for them. So essentially, while I told you about these collaborative uh, action research approaches to go about um, you know, the field of digital mental health and engaging stakeholders um, around sort of harnessing these uh, you know, digital troughs of data, uh, there is still a need for more research that needs to happen to identify what could be the best ways to represent uh, the voices of the uh, different stakeholders in this process so that the technologies and the interventions that we could potentially get to in a few years time hopefully um, they're just um, they're fair and they're ethical so on that note, uh, I would like to conclude here. Um, I would like to thank all my students, uh, many of you you can see on the slide, um, uh, and of course the uh, collaborators, the sponsors without whom none of this work would have been possible. Um, I think I have time for a few questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Moonmoon, for the really interesting talk. Yeah, and we have like 15 minutes. So I would like to ask the audience uh, if they have any questions, they can write it in the in the chat box uh, on the left on or right on the on YouTube. Um, in the meantime, I would like to ask you a little bit about because this is a concern that I have had for some time doing very similar work, and it has to do when we ask participants in our studies about their values and about what they think of giving the data away, it doesn't tell us much about what people who are not participants think, because it's quite a... So in particular, with regards to do they want to be acted on? You, know? uh, you very nicely explained uh, three of the biomedical ethics uh, pillars, you know? mm, the idea of supporting well-being, like obviously we are doing here, supporting or making sure that we do no harm and fairness. Uh, one that I'm particularly interested in, I would like your opinion about is autonomy. Um, how can we create systems that support autonomy um, and not hinder it? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really important question because, um, you know, this um, uh, this type of research is often blindsided, like you rightly said, Rafa, by people who are sharing the data. We um, understand very little uh, when people don't share or people don't want to share or they don't have a social media account, right? Um, that there is there are questions of digital divide as well and not just social media, it goes with smartphone and whatnot um, um, and so on. So, so what about um, those individuals? I think uh, in general, our research um, has um, said that um, people um, struggling with mental health challenges, they see value for this kind of research. So uh, in general, um, these individuals are more willing to kind of share their data for science compared to other healthy individuals. Um, so that is uh, that is a positive thing. The other thing we have seen is that informally, in some ways, these data are already being brought as a part of clinical conversations. Um, uh, many young patients are already pulling out their smartphones, they're showing their text messages and you know their phone logs and their Facebook Messenger um, and, and, and TikToks and whatnot uh, to their clinicians and they're structuring their conversations around that. So I think there is a potential there also to showcase the value to the patient that when it comes to these questions of autonomy, you still have the autonomy in here. We are just giving you tools to support your collaborative um, health care relationship with your clinician. I think that piece will be important as we kind of build these algorithms kind of making sure that the power to use them still rests with uh, the people um, struggling with a mental illness and 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 um, instead of kind of feeling that we are living in this world where algorithms are making assessments about their mental health that is not the future where we want to live in um, I think um, the role of the algorithm here is to augment um, not to take away agency from people and I think that'll be very important going forward thank you uh, one of the people in the audience is asking marketing is using this information to sell products too like in social media etc and I, I guess that's a concern that many people that have after Cambridge Analytica and so forth know that can we trust social media companies no, with this type of information that is a really valid concern um i think um you know there are some positives um many companies are taking um uh, a proactive approach to recognize at least that uh, mental health is a question that they cannot avoid um so i think there are some um uh, there's some research that are being done by these companies on the positive side um to tackle this question but yeah third party access to data this is a huge problem and i think you know as we think about um the benefits that these algorithms and these data can bring to people i kept on saying that you know we cannot avoid or ignore thinking about these unintended negative consequences uh, or bad actors who want to kind of use these data uh, for their own selfish uh, pursuits. I think we have to think about what does, um, I mean, regulation is one path. I, I personally feel a little skeptical how much that can be helpful. But yeah, I mean, some form of restriction or boundaries on who can use what data for these purposes we need to define that and it's not just marketing you know there are questions of how do how will you know insurance agencies use this data how would law enforcement uh, people use these data there are so many people who could have a vested interest in this and we have to think about drawing some boundaries there and this is a very important question that i don't think us as computer scientists can address alone but i think that's why we need these action research these kind of collaborative approaches so that we can begin to have those conversations of drawing those boundaries yeah this is a concern that many people in the uk have now because the uk government um has set up this system for collecting uh, medical data from every resident um, wow and it's going to be released to companies and that could easily include companies like google that have their social media platforms but they also have life sciences units and businesses so then the question is what are they going to do with it and they have kind of conflicts no um, mm. wow. and it's an opt-out mechanism so 
probably many people in the audience uh, from the UK will not even know that they need to opt out. Or I think next week okay. the data will be made available for uh, both research, academic research, but also for commercial purposes. Um, obviously, wow, yeah. anonymized, uh, uh, but the anonymity when you provide such big data set becomes very difficult, as we know. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I I think there is a gap, right? I mean, I don't even know. I mean, uh, how much people in the government kind of really understand some of the risks that this might pose. Um, we have seen that in a lot of congressional hearings that involved some of the tech companies here and the politicians in the U.S. Uh, people don't understand, and 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 I think there is a piece about education and awareness as well. Um, um, that is super important that, yeah, I mean, the, creating a database generally sounds like a great idea, but uh, we just have to flip a few pages of history and go back to the Second World War to figure out what can happen when we create databases of people. Um, so yeah, something for us to, to really think about deep and hard right now. Yeah, because I think what happens is uh, um, researchers like ourselves um, see all these opportunities to, to do good with this. Um, but then the trick is to, like you said before, make sure that they don't have negative consequences. One of the people in the audience is asking, when will LGPD impact these boundaries? Uh, I'm not sure if uh, this is referring to the European, uh, a misspelling of the European GDPR. I'm not sure what LGPD is. I, I don't know either. Um, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think what needs to happen if it is indeed uh, the, the version of GDPR, I think uh, it, the, that question of autonomy that you raised, Rafa, earlier is super important. I mean, having transparent and easy ways for people to opt out. If, if the default is opt in, people should be made aware there should be transparency in terms of uh, them knowing that they have the autonomy that I, if I don't want, want my data in the database, here are a clear set of steps I can follow to opt out. It shouldn't be something hidden and difficult and um, kind of opaque, uh, you know, written in legal language that most people like us don't understand. I think that is that is super important because, you know, the nice thing about GDPR is that it does give that autonomy to people to have control of their data. And we want to continue to have that when we talk about algorithms as well. Yeah, there are so many challenges for the future. Uh, one of the ones you mentioned there that I think is very interesting is the issue of fairness. So also, if we don't have access to the data of the more disadvantaged communities, then there is, uh, we have higher error rates and therefore we are not able to serve them as well. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? How can we improve or reduce the bias in in data sets and algorithms yeah you know that's such an important uh, question i um was giving a talk um a couple of years ago and somebody asked uh, and i never get that question it was the first time that kind of really struck me uh the question was uh you know yeah but everybody doesn't use social media and if your algorithms are working so well and somebody doesn't have social media because they don't have the financial means to own a smartphone or a computer um to to have a social media account you will be treating them unfairly and i was like this is such an important question right because we just we just think about again the people who are on social media we fail to think about the people who are not or can't be. I think the opportunity here is to really therefore go beyond sort of one data source approaches. And, and the second project I talked about kind of begins to get at that at the population level. But you can think about these um, at the individual or group level as well. Um, somebody uh, may not be on social media or may not have a smartphone, but there may be another source of data, another mechanism that they're using to connect with the mental health care system, maybe through a phone, uh, maybe by going to the emergency department or talking with their primary care physician. So I think that is the potential there to, to combine and harness signals from different data sources. Of course, it comes with its own set of privacy and ethical challenges as well, because we are kind of 
multiply, multiplying the risks by connecting different data sources. But that is one approach that we have to think about when um, we want to reduce some of these inequities in access. Um, the other approach could be to really think about the limitations of these algorithms, that these algorithms have been built by data of people with these types of behaviors and attributes, and they don't they may not necessarily work on people with a different set of attributes. Uh, something that in, in you know in the uh, machine learning community um, are being emphasized as model cards and data sheets and so on. So bringing transparency to what a data set can and cannot do. So I think those approaches can also be valuable here. Um, one thing that sometimes uh, I, I think about, I have a background, I studied physics in a, in a previous life. And one of the difficulties in certain experiments is when the instrument is having an impact or on the experiment itself. Uh, and in this case, when we have technologies that mediate our experiences, like in social media, the social media platform itself has an emotional impact in our, on our lives, right? So the question is, are there ways of measuring the validity of these algorithms? Because there is the, the life without social media and the life with social media. Uh, so you are mentioning people who cannot access because of money or other reasons, but there might be other reasons why people don't want to, you know, like the emotional load that you find when you go in Facebook and all these people are you barely know are trying to contact you uh, or, you know, etc. So what we are measuring is an experience that is being influenced by the instrument that we use to measure. See, see what I mean? So the question is, how can we separate that effect? Uh, and what is the impact on the type of research we're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is such an important question because this, even for the people who do use social media, they have different intentions, they have different goals, different kinds of networks, right? Uh, some people use Twitter only for academic purposes. Uh, some people use a, a, a Twitter only for political reasons, uh, political conversations and whatnot. So there are a lot of differences. And, and that underscores the need for personalized approaches. Something that I talked about in the, in the first case study is that every person is different. So how they use social media is different. And what we can learn from the social media will also be different. So I think the important piece here is to kind of work with uh, and uh, the particular individual social media data and then look at it, um, you know, in a way that would tell us what kind of behaviors are anomalies or what kind of behaviors kind of stand out, because we know that that digital signature can be really different from someone else. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, the, the reality is that you know we are dealing with a situation where um, social media is a part of life in different ways, and um, we have to factor that in as well. Yeah, totally. No, and you just raised another really, really interesting point. I hadn't thought about that. When we could be having psychotic bots or suicidal bots, you know, because a lot of the traffic that is happening in social media, it's, it's actually machines pretending to be humans you know, for marketing or political you know, uh, manipulation and so forth. Um, have you thought about how all that data can be separated? So we often um, kind of use off-the-shelf algorithms to separate that out. Um, but I think, you know, it, it begs an important question when we think about interventions, right? I mean, um, and, and sort of the impact. You were mentioning earlier the impact of social media on people's mental health. And now we are kind of talking about not just other humans' conversations or messages having an impact, but also these bots having an impact on our mental health as well. So I think we have to kind of maybe uh, separate them out um, and see the differential impact that bots or automated accounts have on people, what people have on people and kind of, you know, kind of even look at people's engagement with automated accounts or other human accounts. And that distinction is gonna become more and more critical going forward. Another area of very interesting research is when uh, uh, social media has been used to understand the uh, political movements. Sorry, my dog has gone crazy emotional. Um, 
so I wonder how those two things can be connected. No, we see so much with COVID, uh, so much political influence in regarding, um, you know, how vaccines or how many cases we have, and uh, and people have politicized uh, a public health issue. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, one, I, I keep on thinking that one big learning, we have had many learnings during the pandemic. One important one that uh, uh, connects well with this conversation is that we are no, mental health is no longer an isolated issue, right? Uh, it is deeply intertwined between sort of the environments we live in, the societies, the communities we are a part of, and the ongoing political climate in, in our, uh, around us. And uh, we cannot ignore all of those considerations when we think about mental health interventions. And um, in some ways, social media kind of exacerbates that because you kind of see sort of this onslaught, these uh, misinformation, propaganda, politicization of whether mask wearing in the US um, or it is uh, vaccines or, or who is responsible behind all of this. So we, we have seen all of that in the last uh, year and a half, and then that can have an impact on people's mental health. So I think we have to kind of look in its entirety when we think about mental health um, of people. Thank you so much, Moonwon. I, I, I think uh, I could keep talking with you for, for hours, um, <laughs> but I think our hour has passed on um, people in the audience might have other duties or responsibilities, and you too as well. So I would like to uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Um, I will just use a, a couple of minutes to invite people to follow up uh, the school, Dyson School of Design Engineering on LinkedIn. This is a, a Moon Moon was our last talk of our distinguished speaker seminar series, and we will restart it uh, in January with a fantastic group of new speakers. Uh, so please um, join us then. Um, thank you very much for a wonderful um, talk. Thank you very much, Rafa. I appreciate uh, the invitation. <laughs>